Hey everybody, welcome back to another The Book of Boba Fett breakdown. Today we're going to be breaking down episode 4, and might I say this was probably my second favorite episode after episode 2. There was so much that happened in this one, and so many little easter eggs that a lot of you might not have noticed, and if you did, dude, my hat's off to you. This one's going to be a really cool breakdown to do, so let's get right into it, because we got a lot to discuss. Okay, so first we start the episode with Boba in his Bacta. Beautiful scenery, beautiful in the background with the twin sons. This takes us into the events of the past with a flashback, as Boba begins his road to avenge the Tuscans who helped him. As he makes himself some food at campfire with his bantha, he sees lights overhead in the distance, and we get the Mando theme playing for the first time in the Book of Boba Fett. He travels over to find Fennec on his bantha, and this is a direct connection to The Mandalorian Season 1, Episode 5, where Fennec dies and gets saved by that mysterious man walking. Now this man is Boba Fett. Boba takes lifeless Fennec to the outskirts of Mos Espa to a mod shop, where we have essentially a place for upgrades. He's greeted by a few of the cyborgs outside, and it's very cyberpunk-esque. We even see Vegeta with his scouter, and the chop engineer inside fixes someone up when Boba says, hey, she's about to die, and drops a sack of credits. Now, you guys were telling me last night that the guy that's actually the modder is Thundercat. I had no idea, but hey, thanks for telling me. Fennec gets modded, and when Boba says, aren't you going to cover it up? The modder says no, because it would cover all that beautiful machinery. So obviously these modders are all about showing off their new parts, and instead of concealing them like we know most cybernetics to be in Star Wars, like Luke's hand for example, they really like showing them off. So this kind of explains the Power Ranger crew that we saw, which I know they're not the Power Rangers, but we just joke about them, it's become like a running joke now at this point. But they essentially are like these guys, they're like on the outskirts of Tatooine, they're kind of nomads so to speak perhaps, and they just spend all their money on upgrading their parts and upgrading their bikes and making them super shiny and standing out because this is like their way of living this is their tradition this is what's cool in their world so i get that i understand that that being said i still don't think those bikes really fit in star wars but anyways moving on fennec wakes up in the desert by campfire with boba and he tells her what happened to her and who he is she figured him to be dead but clearly not as they were both left for dead on the sands of tatooine he tells her to take the black melon, and this is a drink that the Tuscans showed him how to find, and it's essentially like coconut milk. It hydrates you, fills you with nutrients, and the Tuscans live off of this stuff, among other variances of sustenance. He tells her how he was rescued by the Sand People, and blames himself for getting them killed by the Nikto bikers. He blames himself because of when he jumped them at Tashi Station, people there probably saw his clothing and weapons, and word got around, you know, they saw his gaffy stick belonging to the Tuscans, so they took him as a Tuscan as well. So word gets around, and with conjunction of the Pikes telling the Nikta that the Tuscans have also offered them safety, interfering in the money that the Nikta gang could make, so the gang went out and killed them. All except, of course, the warrior woman Tuscan which we still have yet to be seen, and will probably join Boba's group now at this point. Boba and Fennec decide to go retrieve Boba's Slave One ship, which he calls his Fire Spray, which is the model of his ship, but not the actual name. I feel like Fennec wouldn't know what the hell a Slave One is, even if he did call it by its name, but I hope that they still use the name in Star Wars, because it's been an iconic name for decades. She sends in a drone, which reminds me of the eye drone sent to spy on Qui-Gon and Anakin in Phantom Menace, by Darth Maul. Boba mentions to Fennec that he was ready to leave bounty hunting behind, so I guess this means that he was tired of it and why he wants to become a crime lord now. He's tired of working for scug holes. Fennec retrieves her drone and it presents a map, which reminds me of Jedi Fallen Order. Their plan is to sneak in. Now, I want you to watch this scene again for yourself, because not many will recognize, and if you did, my man. Fennec takes the cutter to the bars, and the sound is the same sound when Anakin takes Dooku's head in Revenge of the Sith. I love how they added that in there. I feel like it's a little nod to the Grievous droid that we see in a minute, who also loses his head with the same device. We see the droids making food, and they think the noise of Boba and Fennec is a rat. So they call the Rat Catcher droid. As Boba takes out the first droid, the other turns into a General Grievous, spinning his arms, which was a beautiful little Easter egg until, of course, his head gets taken off. 
The rat hunting droid walks in and Boba ends up playing cat and mouse with it, eventually getting it, where we later see him in Boba's palace still. So he clearly took to the droid and he kept him to, you know, keep the rats out. Gonk droid can be seen just as Boba and Fennec lay eyes on Slave 1. They get ambushed by the guards and Boba gets in the ship. Now this is in the same position, of course this is like landing position, but this is a big callback in my mind to when little Boba was firing turrets on Obi-Wan Kenobi in Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, with Obi-Wan fighting his father Jango Fett on Kamino. I loved seeing the console again since The Mandalorian. Fennec takes out the guards in perfect assassin style and precision, while Boba maneuvers the ship around, destroying the walls until finally they escape. Fett tells her that he'll fix the ship up himself. There's an advantage to people thinking you're dead. So I think that he probably won't use his ship in densely populated areas, because of course the galaxy knows Boba's ship. The Slave One is iconic all the way from Django. Now, in Legends, of course, there were like four different fire spray ships that Boba had, but of course in canon here, it is the same one that Jango had, the Slave One ship. This also makes me wonder if this is the reason why Boba is staying on Tatooine the entire time. Because he can't fly off as people would recognize his ship and know that he's alive, and he's not ready yet, he's not at full power which he finally gets to in this episode. Boba hunts down the Nikta gang who killed the Tuscans and absolutely obliterates them. This was the coolest scene so far of the show. I loved it, it was badass. They fly into the mouth of the Sarlacc over the pit of Carcoon, looking for his armor. They get pulled in. Now you're probably wondering, well, why doesn't he remember that he didn't have his armor when he went, got to the Tuscan camp? And I'm gonna get to that in a minute. So they eventually get overpowered by the beast by flying over its mouth and it tries to pull them in when Fennec finally drops a seismic charge into the Sarlacc's mouth, and the most beautiful sound in Star Wars is made with a bright explosion, ending the life of the very old Sarlacc. Now the first time we saw a seismic charge, or rather heard a seismic charge, which obliterated my ears when I was uh, 12 years old in the movie theater, and it was a beautiful thing. I did it another several times when I saw the film. We saw it when Jango was trying to get rid of Obi-Wan Kenobi in Episode 2 Attack of the Clones. So one thing I want to mention here is we see the Sarlacc's beak, which is a nice little nod to George Lucas's additional CGI effect in Return of the Jedi in the special edition version. So the reason Boba doesn't remember his suit wasn't on him when he went to the Tusken camp is probably, and this is just of course a Star Wars theory, because he was so dehydrated and delirious that he doesn't remember he escaped with it on until the Jawas stole it from him and knocked him out. We also learn that his suit is made of Beskar when Fennec says that it would have melted in the stomach of the Sarlacc. Boba says, not Beskar. So it's confirmed that his suit is indeed Mandalorian iron, which was a confusing topic in Legends and Canon, but now it's settled. They sit around another fire and discuss things. Boba tells her that he's tired of bounty hunters dying because of the idiocy of those who hire them. Like Jabba, for example. He tells her that he wants to start a house, and that he needs brain and muscle. So it's going very Game of Thrones here now at this point. He cuts her in on the success and offers his loyalty. Fennec accepts, and they are now a team. She tells him that living with the Tuscans has made you soft. He reassures her, and us, the audience, that it's made him strong. He claims you can only get so far without a tribe, which is very true. You know, this means that he understands the value of a good team and what it will bring him. Boba is maturing and his development as a character is evolving. He leaves his Bacta and the droid tells him his healing is finally complete. We're probably done with flashbacks, which is bittersweet because for me I really like the Tuscan moments and the explaining of what was happening, but now I'm very excited that we get to move forwards with the story in present time. We head back to Madame Garza Whip's bar and we see Black Chrysanthemum. He's had a few drinks and he's raging at the sight of Trandoshans. Now I implore you, please go watch my many videos on Black Chrysanthemum, mainly the one on him fighting Bosk as it explains a lot, particularly about this scenario here. He hates Trandoshans and Trandoshans hate Wookiees. The reason for this in very short is that Trandoshans enslaved Wookiees. The mere sight of them infuriates the other. Madame Garza walks in and stops him by telling him and everyone that he's a famed gladiator. He's won every match, every trophy, and to let this Trandoshan go. Of course, she just you know wants the, her bar to keep making money and not have you know some terrible thing happen like this. So, what is the one thing that Wookies do to beings that they dislike? Well, if you didn't know, it's that they rip the arms off of them and beat them with it. There was actually a deleted scene in The Force Awakens where. 
Chewbacca rips the arms off of Unkar Plut, who was basically enslaving Rey, and beats him with it. I don't know why they removed that scene, but it would have been pretty cool to see it. You actually can see it, it's on YouTube. It's a deleted scene. And this is exactly what Black Chrysanthemum does. He rips the arm off of the Trandoshan, and that's it, drops him to the ground. He doesn't listen to her and does what he needs to do. And don't worry, Trandoshans regrow their limbs, so it's not a big deal, they're like reptiles. Boba took the legs off of Bosk ones in canon, and they regrew back, so it's no big deal. He did that in one of the comics. We also get confirmation that this is Max Rebo, as she tells him, Hit it, Max. Max Rebo was in Jabba's barge before it blew up. He was the one uh, just playing the music and making the atmosphere real cool in there. Boba follows Chrysanthemum outside and offers him a job. This is the moment that I was waiting for. Boba and Chrysanthemum teaming up, and with Mando coming in next episode most likely, this is going to be so freaking awesome, dude. Boba sits at the head of his table and tells the leaders of different territories, which we found out in episode, I think it was one or two, that he doesn't want claim on their parts. He just wants them to join in fighting the Pikes. The Pikes are very powerful and they have turned Tatooine into part of their spice trade. Now, spice is a drug and they're essentially just turning it into this hub for selling spice and they're sucking Tatooine dry. They've bought off the mayor and they still can't find the mayor, sadly, because he's probably hiding with the Pikes and so things have gotten too far and if Boba really wants to rule Tatooine, or at least Mos Espa to start, he needs to make sure the Pikes are out of Tatooine and aren't selling spice and making it a sort of hub for their spice trade. The leaders tell him that they make a profit on the sale of spice, so they probably get a tax on it. They tell him why should he be the leader? Why don't they just kill him? When Boba's rancor finally lets them know what's up and we see the massive size of his claws, they eventually settle on a truce and staying neutral should the pikes try to turn them against Boba. And Fett tells them in return he'll fight the pikes and keep Tatooine safe for their loyalty in at least just staying neutral. So this is awesome, man. Look, the leaders of the territories don't want to join, and for me this is cool because it leaves room for new muscle to come in. As they all leave in their speeders, Boba and Fennec watch them from the top of his tower, and he tells her that he doesn't trust them. He just feels that their intentions are focused on what they want. This scene reminds me of a Game of Thrones moment, where he tells her that we must prepare for war. She asks if he has credits, and he assures her that they're rich. She tells him credits can buy muscle if you know where to look, and gives him a little bit of a uh, look, a little smirk there. And we get the beautiful and infamous Mandalorian theme playing, which we haven't heard in so long, meaning that he's now going to call upon the help of Mando, Din Djarin, and who knows who else. Probably Bosk, maybe Dengar, his buddies. Now, personally, if you ask me, I want Bosk to be playing on the side of the pikes. The relationship between Boba and Bosk is a really weird one. They're like friends and Bosk is kind of his mentor, but also they've like fought each other so many times in the comics, but they've made up at the same time. It's just super weird. So it could go one of two ways. You know, they could fight again and they could end up being friends again. Who knows? I think the rest of the season is going to be an absolute banger. I'm really excited for it. I think Boba will go to Mandalore and get Din Djarin to join him. I hope he doesn't just call him up or, you know, get in touch with the guild to get in touch with Din Djarin. I hope we see live action Mandalore and all of the Mandos join in, including Bo-Katan. I want to find out what happened during the purge when the Empire took over after Order 66 and they took over Mandalore with all the clones there. What really happened? How did they strip everything of Mandalore and Iron? You know, why is it so incredibly rare at this point and hard to find. The thing is, if Mando joins Boba, then most likely everybody else will join too, as Mando is the leader of Mandalore now, because he has the Darksaber. If you remember, before Luke Skywalker showed up in the Mandalorian Season 2 finale, Din Djarin beat Moff Gideon, and he took the Darksaber from him, and Bo-Katan had a real problem with this because she wanted to rule Mandalore. And uh, it just doesn't work like that where you can just give her the Darksaber, she has to win it in a trial by combat. So my question here is, where is Grogu? Where is Luke? Could we see them? I think from here, Boba will create his own little suicide squad of baddies, and I want to see him, Chrysanthemum, Fennec, Bosk, Dengar against Cad Bane, the Pikes, and Kira. And you know what, I'd be really cool with them putting Bosk on the opposite side too, with the Pikes, with Cad Bane, with Kira. I think that would make it interesting for a fight between Chrysanthemum and Bosk, because they have fought in the comics, they have also worked together, and of course, Wookiees and Trandoshans absolutely hate each other. 
I hope you guys are caught up. I hope you guys are looking forward to episode five. I am extremely excited. You can probably tell by my voice and by my energy. I just can't wait for this episode and it's going to be pretty freaking cool. So thanks for watching this breakdown. I love you all. Hope you have a great rest of your day and stay tuned for the many, many videos to come explaining Black Chrysanthemum, explaining the Pike Syndicate, explaining Crimson Dawn and so much more. It's a great time to be excited for Star Wars. I couldn't be more stoked. Hope you all have a great day. See you in the next one. Until then, remember, the Force will be with you always.